Well, good morning, Grace Bible Church. We are so glad that you are here this morning on this live stream online. So thanks for joining us. My name is Jeremy, one of the pastors, and it's a privilege just to welcome you. And probably some of you, this might be a new experience for you to engage in the chat, to text hello. There is multiple ways to engage with us. Betsy and her team are there standing by. They can pray for you. Uh, they can chat with you. So let us know you're watching, and uh, we are so thankful that you're joining us today. As we step into worship this morning, uh, I want to read some scripture just to kind of set our hearts. So wherever you are, um, maybe stop, pause. If you're shuffling about in the kitchen trying to get everybody organized for church or maybe you're driving, maybe pull over. Uh, I'm going to read Romans 8, verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wherever you're at, we stand, worship with us this morning. Just as Jeremy said, we encourage you to really engage with us this morning, thinking of those words, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. The battles belong to him. Let's sing this together this morning. This is a new song we've been learning here. Sing it with us as you catch on. battle you see my victory when all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear 
you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against battle does indeed belong to God and so we trust him as we sing this morning we're going to continue in worship this morning we want to encourage you just to bring your yourself to him this morning all the things in your life anything that maybe has got you anxious concerned anything you're excited about you're hoping in just bring everything before God this morning he understands our frame he knows us so we bring it to him and we sing and we worship Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance
I can just bank on the fact that it is great singing wherever you are this morning. And so we encourage you to find your seat, and um, we're going to hear a little bit more uh, from Jeremy this morning on some of the important things going on around here. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, a few things to tell you about. Uh, the first one, the first two actually are happening today. At 1145, we're going to go live with our annual meeting. So gracebibleag.com slash live, this exact same space. Uh, we will have our annual meeting where members will affirm some new elders, deacons, nominating committee. And if you're not a member, we've got a membership class for you today at 3 o'clock. And you can email us at hello at gracebibleag.com to register for that or just show up to that membership class online, 3 o'clock today. Uh, also, this week we've been talking a lot about these foundation uh, classes happening. It is starting this Tuesday night. 7 o'clock online. Again, email us if you want to connect. But we are talking uh, about money this Tuesday. We got an FPU expert. His name is Victor. FPU stands for Financial Peace University, Dave Ramsey guy. They're going to be uh, opening it up for some discussion about finances. And if this past year or eh, the last three weeks you've set some goals maybe for money or COVID has really changed the game with your finances, this would be a great place to start and have some conversations. So we would love to see you there uh, Tuesday night. Also, next Sunday, we got a welcome party. Like, what's a welcome party? Well, if you're new, you've engaged with us for a little bit, whether you're online or in the parking lot, and you're trying to just meet and greet and see what in the world Grace Bible Church is, next week there's a welcome party for you to meet some other folks who are in the same boat, just kind of checking this church thing out. And so shoot us an email at hello, and we can get you connected for how that welcome party is going to go. Uh, the last thing I just want to talk through is our giving, and uh, many of you have shifted giving online, and we are so grateful for that. We are six months through our fiscal year, and so uh, we just got some numbers for you of how we ended the year. Uh, they are there for you. This is July through December. That's half of our fiscal year, and uh, budgeted giving is 1.2. Our actual giving, you can see, is about 74,000 shy of that. And so we're trying to make that up this next year. You can tell with our expenses, we've dialed back our expenses a little bit. The difference there is 62,301. And over this next six months, we'll dial back expenses as we need to. We'd love to close this gap with uh, the budget here looking forward. And so we want to say thank you. With all the finance updates and expenses, God has been doing some incredible things. As I've looked back at expenses and money and all that stuff, seeing how lives have been changed and impacted through you, through your generous giving, we will commit to be great stewards of that and see this church move forward. So we want to say thank you for giving. If you haven't shifted your giving online, we would encourage you to do that. You can do that via the app. You can do that online at gracebibleag.com slash give. I'm going to pray, uh, thank God for what he's done, uh, and as we look forward with giving, we're going to pray. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, I'm grateful for the folks in this church who sacrificially give, God, and for the ministry that has happened over the past six months. We're so grateful for the lives changed, for the new people showing up for the baptisms, for the salvations. God, we're grateful. But we do look forward with anticipation, with eagerness. God, to see this movement grow, to see your work continue. God, I pray for those who maybe haven't stepped into giving. God, that they would step in today. Understand the benefits of what it means to give to a local church. God, move in their hearts. Pray for this foundations class on Tuesday this Q&A, that folks would engage with that. Lord, as we continue our service and worship, God, would you grow us? Would you move us? Would you shape us, transform us? I love you so much. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
sing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melody sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise His name I'm fixed upon it Name of God's own Good morning. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we're excited to be in Exodus 14 today, if you want to turn there to Exodus chapter 14 in your Bibles. Let's pray as we open up God's Word this morning. Father, thank you for this time to be centered on something eternal, and as we learn today that you are a God who delivers your people, you are a God who is with us. And we thank you for the time we have today. I pray that you would speak through this gift of these resources you've given us, cameras and, and internet streams and all those things. Help us to uh, sense your connection with us as we look to be connected together in these, these different times we're living. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, yesterday, uh, I took my son, Michael, to get some new basketball shoes. And, um, you know, when I became aware that I was going to be a dad, I had no idea that it would either be feed my family or put shoes on their feet. I cannot believe how much it costs to put shoes on kids' feet. Wow. So we're walking through the outlets over here in Pismo, and um, there's a little mechanical horse right outside the Nike store. And I noticed this little girl, she probably was, she couldn't have been two years old. I'm sure she was even younger than that. And she's on this horse, and she's just riding this horse. And, and it just goes up and down a little bit, and, and she has a grin on her face like she's on a rocket to the moon. I mean, she is thrilled. And then as we're passing by, the ride stops. And you hear the mommy say, well, that's all, ride's over, and she, her countenance goes from 
The joy, uh, to end all joys, to absolute desperate, please, mommy, please, one more, mommy, one more. I want to go one more time. And it reminded me, as I'm walking by her, this little girl with my son, I, I thought of the way that Jesus wants us to approach him. I thought of the, the, the call of Scripture to come to the king and the kingdom with a faith like a child. Don't stop children from coming because they seem to understand exactly what I'm trying to communicate. Absolute joy, reckless dependence, and an understanding of how God wants us to approach him. I think a lot of us, we get older in years and we talk ourselves out of that kind of joy, that kind of dependence. We turn from this sense of enjoying what God is doing and enjoying who God is to, to overthinking it a little bit. And, and that childlike faith is gonna be required as we walk through this amazing story and account in scripture of a day that God delivered the people. And as we come across this story, we, we can't forget to have that faith like, like a child. Don't forget that God has the power to create and save, to heal and deliver, not to forget that he can speak through burning bushes and part raging waters. We cannot forget that we serve a God and worship a God today who's more powerful than anything you will ever face, even death. And don't forget that he's good. He's always working. And we're going to see that in a living color today in Exodus chapter 14. We're going to see God deliver his people. We're continuing the Bible project. We're going to read through the Bible, experience the scriptures this year. I trust that you're connected with us and doing the reading with us. We're hearing great reports about things people are learning and even just the discipline of doing something that puts and plants God's word into our hearts, just that by itself is, is movement toward what God would have for us. We've seen in this introductory series of the Bible project called Beginnings, God beginning things, God creating. We, we see the beginnings of the world as we know it in, in these seven days of creation. We see the first humans, the first couple, the first family, the beginning of a nation. And we looked at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the, the second half of the book of Genesis is about a single family, a single dysfunctional family. And last week we closed with Joseph, who would confess to his brothers who sold him into slavery that what you meant for evil, God meant for good. In Genesis chapter 50, Joseph is about to die. He was 110 years old. But before he dies, he gathers his family and he reminds them of something that, that I want us to be reminded of today, that we're part of a massive story. Joseph wanted them to remember that they're part of something bigger than just them, bigger than just today. He says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, and Joseph said to his brothers, they're, they're gathered together, his family, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land, the land of Goshen in Egypt where they're currently living, that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. A couple weeks ago we looked at Genesis chapter 12, a promise that God made to the people through Abraham, that he would bless those who bless him, curse those who curse him. All the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham, and which includes us, which includes a future for us even into eternity. And Joseph, aware of this promise, his dying words are, don't forget what God said he would do. The people are in Goshen, they're in Egypt, they've been brought there by Joseph to be protected. Many, many years go by, Joseph dies. And as we open up the book of Exodus, we come in the very beginning of the book of Exodus chapter one to this, this frightful thought that there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That means a lot of years have passed. 
God's people are still in Goshen. They're still there in Egypt. They're under the, the reign and rule of Pharaoh. The original Pharaoh who knew Joseph brought them there to protect and provide for them, give them the choicest land as a way to honor Joseph. But that Pharaoh died. The next Pharaoh who remembered died. Pharaohs have died. And now there's a, there's a Pharaoh, a leader, a king in Egypt who says, Joseph who? What was the problem? No, these people will serve us. And they became slaves. They became servants to the people of Egypt. And they were there for 400 years. The beginning of the book of Exodus is about these people and God wanting them delivered. He calls a man named Moses, who's the next major figure in the story of God's, of God's word, of, of the story of our lives. Moses is one born in Pharaoh's house, delivered miraculously by his mother, who sent him in a basket down a river. Pharaoh had decided that the people of Israel, the, the Hebrews, were too many. He was afraid they were going to overtake the Egyptians, so he ordered the deaths of children. Moses was supposed to be killed, but he was saved. He was rescued. He's pulled out of the river by the daughter of Pharaoh and raised in Pharaoh's house. Moses becomes the one God chooses to deliver the people. Moses in Exodus chapter 3 is a reluctant, a reluctant servant. He's called by God. He's called before a burning bush. He's called to holy ground. Moses, you will be the one who delivers my people. God, I can't. They won't believe me. I'm not, I don't, I'm not a good communicator. All the excuses Moses gave all the excuses that we give when God calls us to, I don't have the time, don't have the money, I don't have the skills, I don't have the whatever, and we forget that behind the calling is a God who's creative and powerful, who calls us to serve him, who can multiply what we have to cause it to fill the gaps of what we know we don't have. That's exactly the way God works. That's the way he wants it. Moses says, God, when I go to Pharaoh, who shall I say sent me? And God describes himself in Exodus chapter 3 as the I am. Tell him the I am, for I am who I am. A sense of God's power and eternality. Basically a declaration that I'm all you need. Of course, Moses goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, forget it, I'm not getting rid of my slave labor. And then there's 10 plagues. You can read about that in the early part of Exodus. Plague after plague, mercy after mercy is given to Pharaoh to cause his heart to relent, but his heart remains hard. And finally, there's the plague of the firstborn, the Passover, the angel of death comes through Egypt. It is frightening to read. It is the summation of hardness and disobedience. It's what happens when you challenge God, you lose and there is destruction. Pharaoh relents, lets the people go. They celebrate their freedom. Remember, they've been crying out to God for a deliverer. God sends them one, and now they're on their way out of Egypt toward a place called Baal Zephon. Baal Zephon, at the base of the Red Sea, a place where people get stuck. And in Exodus chapter 14, we see God's profound deliverance of these people being led by Moses. Let's pick it up in Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. The people have been released. Now remember, they went into Egypt as the family of Jacob. There were like 70 people. Now they've emerged as a nation of a couple of million. The reason why God had them there was to surmise the sins of the Canaanites to purify their people, but also to protect them. I mean, had they stayed in Canaan where they were and they emerged as this massive nation, they may have been conquered by a rival nation. So they are in Egypt, they're growing and multiplying, and now they've become two million people strong, leaving Egypt on their way to freedom, a freedom that they begged God to provide, that he provides for them through Moses. Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of a place called Baal Zephon. 
You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, say they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. The people of Israel have left Egypt and they are called and they're being led by a cloud by day and by fire by night. There's no doubt where they're supposed to go and the cloud and fire lead them to Baal Zephon at the base of the Red Sea, deserts to their left and right, and in a moment the pursuing Egyptian armies behind them. They are stuck. There's no place to go. Each one of us will experience seasons of the time at Baal Zephon where we feel stuck. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to look. Here's how this story continues. Look at verse 5. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? Pharaoh has this moment where he realizes we should not have let these people go. Why did we let them go? And I'm wondering if one of his servants may have at that moment spouted out, well, I could give you 10 reasons why we let them go, O king. Remember the locusts and the sea? Remember the plagues? Remember our confession that their God is obviously working on their behalf? That's why we let them go. And he issues the order. Get the horses and the chariots. Assemble the army. But we are going to chase them down and bring them back or kill them. Pick it up in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Now, mind you, a few chapters earlier, they're crying out to the same Lord, God, for, free us. We're slaves. There may even have been a few people who remembered the promise of Genesis 12 and the covenant of Genesis 15. God, we want to be free. And God heard their cries and freed them. It got hard, it got scary, fear set in. And when fear takes a hold of us, we lose any ability to understand what God might be saying. Our, our, our ears are deafened to his voice because we're so wrapped up in our fears. Are there not enough graves in Egypt? Of course there's plenty of graves in Egypt. The Egyptians were obsessed with death. It was because they were afraid. We're not going to make it. Verse 12, Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Of course, when Moses, by God's power, secured their freedom, they were willing to run through that door. But when it got hard, when it required faith, they failed to believe. But this thing gets amazing in verse 13, and I want to focus on verses 13 through 15 in our remaining time. Moses is their reluctant leader. He, he's in a little bit of a pickle. There's not 15 people in this caravan. There's two million of them. He is their leader. They've been slaves for 400 years. They don't know how to fight. They're not trained as, as soldiers. The only thing that they have is the fear that they're multiplying in their hearts. And they're a mess. But Moses, the leader that he is, in verse 13, he says this. Maybe we should plaster this verse in our car, in our bathroom mirror, hang it from our glasses. Moses said to the people in their fear, 
Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Go forward. Remember, Baal Zephon is a place that has the raging Red Sea in front of them, deserts to their left and right. There's no hope of surviving in the desert. Two million people won't survive that, that journey. And then chariots, warriors, trained soldiers chasing them down. It is the epitome of the feeling of being stuck. Maybe you feel stuck today. There's a fourfold paradigm that we have to remember when we feel stuck, when we feel and are tempted to be afraid. The first thing that Moses calls them to, that God calls us to, is first to fear not. When you feel stuck, first fear not. It's easy to say, isn't it? There's much to fear here. If you've been a slave your entire life, this is generations of slaves in Egypt. You've never held a sword. You've never ridden a horse. You've never had to fight. And the most powerful army on earth is chasing you down. You're going to be afraid. But Moses says, when God's, when God's on the scene, you don't have to be afraid. 365 times, 365 in the Bible, we're told to fear not. I think it's interesting that we have one for every day of the year, one for every day you live, where there are all kinds of reasons to be afraid. You name them, health, money, family, government, whatever you're afraid of, there's a call for you not to be afraid. Fear is paralyzing. The disciples in John chapter 14 have just been told that Jesus is going to leave them. They've left everything to follow him. Guys, I'm leaving. They're going to take my life. But I'll rise again and I'll meet you in Jerusalem. What? John 14 verse 1, do not be afraid. Trust in God. Trust in me. If you're one that lives in a perpetual state of fear, what's gonna happen next? I would challenge you to, be, to saturate your mind with stories like this. They're recorded for us that we might have an opposing thought to all the relentless fear we feel. Even over death, people fear not. Secondly, I love Moses says, stand still, fear not, stand firm, don't move, don't run, don't panic, just stand here. So much of the trouble we get ourselves into is because we seek to cope with all the fears and all that's not right with our lives by running to harmful vices. We're trying to fill the gaps so we go to substances or we go to unhealthy, toxic relationships or we go to, to, to hurting ourselves or we, we run to something else to dull the pain, to distract us, to bury, to bury what hurts. So we run to pleasure or we run to things that are gonna get us distracted from what we need to focus on. And these are all ways that are unhealthy ways of coping with our fears, and God says to them, I know every fiber of your being wants to run and hide, but in your fearlessness, the challenge is stand firm and don't move. He's calling them to every contradictory feeling that's inside them. He is the great contrarian. Every part of you wants to be afraid. Every part of you wants to run, but here, because of me, don't be afraid. In fact, stand here. 
while we're standing, what do we do? Eyes on God. Not on you, not even on Moses, but on God. Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Fear not, stand firm and still. And watch God. Watch what he does. Watch how he steps in and delivers. Watch how he leads you. Watch what he's capable of. You know, my kids are older now, but when they were younger, it reminds me of the times they would fall. Getting, going too fast on a skateboard or running too fast down a hill or so excited to run into the lake and only to find there's a rock there. They trip and they, they skin their knee. They hit their chin. Blood is everywhere. What's the first thing they do? They look, they turn to see, where's my dad? Where's my mom? They don't know what to do. They don't know how to salve the wounds or stop the bleeding. The only thought they have is the one thing I need is daddy. The look says, are you going to step in? The look they give us as parents, are you going to intervene? I need you. I don't know how to take care of this. And so we step in. We wipe the tears. We, we salve the wounds. We stop the bleeding. We tell them, we tell them I'm here. And it might still hurt, but the comfort that you provide your child is 90% of what they're looking for. Moses calls the people to watch God. Put your eyes on him. Watch what happens. Watch what he does. Think about what he's capable of. I think one of the reasons why we have this story, this whole entire drama played out, is so that we will be conditioned to not be afraid to stand and keep our eyes on God, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. For us, watch God do his thing. You know, God has delivered you from more than you can even imagine or comprehend. I can't wait to get to heaven and scriptures tell us or kind of, kind of go under in a little bit of evaluation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and, and God's going to reward those who were faithful. I imagine part of that will be getting to see what today we can't see the ways God protected us, the deliverance he provided that you didn't even know he provided for you. He's shielding us from the harm, even in this moment today, and stories like this are a visual reminder of an invisible truth that we are under God's protection. So fear not, stand firm, eyes on God. And number four, is in verse 15. It's time to move forward. Time to move forward. Sometimes you gotta move. Okay, we've got, our, we've got our brain together. We're not afraid. We're standing firm in the truth that God is real and a deliverer, and our eyes are on him. And so the challenge now in verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Where does go forward? How's that gonna work? At no point in this chapter before this moment has he said, guess what? And let me give you the end of the story. The seas part. The people walk through and they're saved. Sorry to, to, do, to be a, a spoiler there. They don't know that. Moses doesn't even know that. In fact, there's something very interesting between verses 14 and verse 15. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent And between 14 and 15, God says to Moses, why are you crying to me? You know, can I surmise what I think may have happened? And I could be wrong. But I think Moses was the leader he was called to be. He did the leadership thing. He stood up in front of all the people and he said, fear not, stand still, eyes on God, yay! And then turn and like, Lord, 
what's the plan here? <laughs> Water, desert, armies, can you help me here? God says, Moses, why are you crying out to me? Why are, you, why are, we, why are we having this conversation? Go forward. Go toward the water. Verse 16. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. That first step. Can we talk about that first step for a second? Moses has his staff. It's powerful. Earlier in Exodus, you know, he had it. God says, this is going to be a powerful tool for you. You know, put it down. It became a snake. Grab the snake's tail. It became a staff again. And, and it was a powerful, miracle-working piece of, of wood that Moses was given to represent the power of God. Moses calls, God calls Moses and the people to move forward. He first tells him, lift up your staff. Stretch out your hand. I mean, I wonder if Moses was like, what in the world is happening? We're moving forward. I lift up my staff. I lift up my hand. What in the world is going on? <laughs> Verse 19, then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. Pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming in between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. For there to be time for the seas to part, the ground to dry, there needed to be space between the incoming armies of Egypt and the host of Israel. And so the fire that was in front of them leading them is now behind them, confusing the chariots, confusing the pursuing armies. And then we see in verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. What is gonna happen? And as he moves forward by faith, as he raises that staff in hand by faith, the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. Picture this, the waters being a wall to them on their right, on their left. The Egyptians would pursue after the people all passed through. On dry ground, by the way, the bed of the Red Sea was dried so they could walk through. Their carts could walk through their they could walk through with no trouble, get to the other side. And as the armies pursued, the waters collapsed on them, and God was faithful to his promise that they would never see the Egyptians again. It was a massive act of a sovereign God to deliver his people, and the consequences were huge for Egypt. It's hard to read. But the emphasis is on God's delivering power for his people against the things that oppress them. When the story finishes in verse 31, actually I'll read from verse 30. The Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so that the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and his servant and in his servant, Moses. In verse, in chapter 15, they worship. In chapter 16, they're hungry and they complain again. So what do we learn from all of this? You know, I read the Bible through a couple of years ago and there's a note in my Bible, at the very end of the book of Exodus, it's three words that summarize the whole book for me. The three words are God with us. With us. Delivering, providing, forgiving. 
the patience with which God shows his kind and tender heart toward them when he could have many times said, I'm done with you. I mean, it is one chapter and one half before they're whining again. Walls of water! So here we are. And I think the paradigm is the same. I think it's don't be afraid of anything. Because God with us. I think we can stand firm in any and all circumstances because God with us. I think we watch God, eyes on God, because he's with us. And I think in your life, no matter what you're facing, what you're reeling from, what you're believing God for, You can move forward. You can take steps of faith. They may seem insane to your friends and family. That one step, raise your staff, raise your arm in defiance of your circumstances, in defiance of fear. Move forward. Why? Because God is with us. Can you see? Why would we have so much detail, much like Joseph's life? Why? Why 13 chapters? Why every moment of this day and the, and the fire and the clouds and the, and the armies and the fear so that we'll learn to fear not, to stand still, with our eyes on God and move because God is with us. Father, I pray that through this lens, to living rooms and to cars and to people on treadmills, wherever we might be, that you would whisper the invitation to believe by faith, to trust. Somebody may be listening to this and their first step forward is to give their life to you, Jesus, to confess they need you. They've, they've skinned their knee. They've, they've got, they're going too fast and they've gotten themselves all messed up and they're looking for something. I pray, Papa, they would look to you. Even in this moment, they would confess their need for you. They would understand that Jesus died on a cross, that we might be saved and salved of our wounds, given the power to fear not, stand still, watch you and move. Many of your children are listening to this, and I pray, God, that you would give them a path through to victory. They feel stuck. We look at the natural world and we see the Red Sea and, and deserts, and armies, things pursuing us. Give us faith to raise our hands, to call out to you, and to move, take a step, make a confession, do something different. Create momentum for change. May our church family be a place for that transformation to happen. We'll trust you. We love you. We need you. We're all skinned up, and our eyes are on you. Thank you for meeting us here, for you are God with us. May that encourage us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Jason. You know, when we take time thinking through this service we intend to give you a little space after the message because we believe that when God's word is open that he's speaking to you 
And we want to give you time to do business with God, to take these truths that were, were spoken to Israel and, and, and what God's saying to us this morning, that we would fear not, that we would stand firm in him, that we would keep our eyes, our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that we would move in faith. And so this morning, we want to let these songs give language to time of prayer and response to this preaching. Sing with us, pray with us, worship God with us. Oh 
are on him we're not going to grow weary I, I i love those two songs together they speak to what god wants us to leave with today thanks for joining us today i even heard from uh, betsy earlier she's on the chat my mom's watching hi mom i'll call you later today big game tonight if you're watching and you have some questions you have needs you feel stuck you'd like for us to pray for you would you connect right now with one of our hosts that will love to facilitate that prayer, what you need, how we can serve you? Because we're all moving forward with what we know. 
to not be afraid to stand still and keep our eyes on God. One of those, or all of them this week, is what God's calling you to. And I challenge you to think on that. I want to give you a blessing in the form of a prayer that I want to pray over all of us in this moment. So put your hands together for a blessing on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. God, I bless my friends just by lifting and nudging their chin towards you, what you're capable of, that you are a God who fights for your people while we're silent, in our need, skinned and eyes on you. God, keep us from fear. Give us faith to stand and not run. And help us see the small and the big ways that you're at work defending and preserving and leading us. God, I pray for Eli, and Cody and Rachel, and Ben and Silas and Addie, that you would preserve and protect them, that you would heal Eli now, that you would preserve by your miracle working power this boy's life as a testimony of your goodness as he lies in this hospital bed today. We give you praise. Our eyes are on you now and forever. In Jesus' name, pack that blessing up. Put it in your heart. We'll see you next week. God bless you. Thanks for joining us.